Uh, yeah, so just a little bit of background on myself. As Alan said, I'm a longtime pharma and biotech executive. Um, I've started and run four different companies previously before getting into the cannabis space. Uh, and I was CEO at Tilray, which was part of the privateer holdings group for uh, in 2015 and 2016. So uh, joined Organogram in March of this year. And um, so Organogram is publicly traded on the TSX Venture. So we have three levels of our exchanges, the CSC, um, which is more like an over-the-counter uh, grouping, and then the TSX Venture, and then the big board, which is the TSX. So we're on the Venture today. Uh, we're also traded on the OTC exchange here in the U.S. under the symbol OGRMF. So. so here's our standard disclaimer, which I don't need to go into. So I'll tell you a little bit about Organogram, as, uh, as Alan said, we were uh, the third applicant, actually, when Canada was looking to open up the program, uh, and we received the 12th license in March of 2014. And why that's important to note is that of the early applicants and the early companies, uh, it was really critical to get an approval before the end of March in 2014. What that allowed companies like Organogram to do was actually access genetics and product from existing company, existing individuals that were operating under a program previously in place that allowed individuals to grow for their own use and for medical purposes. So we were able to go access a pretty big genetic bank. Uh, one of the big issues current licensed producers, as the new uh, companies are coming into the market space, have in Canada, it's, it's very difficult for them to access genetics. Their only source, source is through existing licensed producers like ourselves, uh, and most companies will not sell genetics, uh, and or to go through a very lengthy and challenging route of accessing seeds through foreign jurisdictions like the Netherlands, uh, which is a very complicated and long process. So the existing producers, especially the companies that had licenses in 2014, um, certainly have a leg up in terms of having a broad scope of genetics. We have a genetic bank of almost 60 products, uh, 14 which are in constant production, and then another 6 to 12 that we vary in and out depending on, uh, you know, the yield and the time of year and what we're looking to produce. So, so as Alan said, we, are, uh, we were the first um, and are still one of only two licensed producers in Atlantic Canada. So Atlantic Canada is the region north of New England. Um, makes up about 15% of the Canadian population. But what's very unique for us in Atlantic Canada and being in New Brunswick is that we have a very low, uh, you know, a low cost of power. So, um, and I'll get into that a little bit later, and a low cost of labor. It's an area that has high unemployment um, in certain regions, so we have up to 10% unemployment. And that means there's a lot of skilled laborers that are out of work and that we're looking to hire people. So there's a big advantage in that. Um, you know, for those of you that have been following the Canadian market, you know that we are at the cusp of adult recreational program uh, coming into being before July 1st of next year. Uh, companies like ourselves, Organogram has been in active build-out mode for the last year, over a year, as we've prepared for that. Um, when the current government got in place led by um, Justin Trudeau, one of the key aspects of that election platform was to move towards a regulated and controlled adult recreational program, and that bill is currently making its way through our parliament, um, and we expect that to be approved by the end of this year or early next year, um, but we're getting guidance on what the program will look like currently. So, um, One of the other key things for us is we are dramatically ramping up our production capacity, which I'll get into, and I'll show you some schematics of what that looks like. Um, and what's important is that's fully funded. So at the end of our last fiscal quarter that we reported, which was the end of May, uh, we had $48.2 million on the balance sheet, um, and we had full capitalization for our build-out, which is critical when you look at companies in the Canadian space. A lot of people are aspiring to build out, but do they have the capital to do that? And that, for us, is a big differentiator. Uh, from a brand positioning perspective, uh, we've got a couple strategic partnerships I'll get into later, uh, one of those being with the Green Solution or TGS out of Colorado, and we believe that positions us incredibly well for the Canadian marketplace as we look to roll out um, the edibles and concentrates program and really build that out, and that's going to be a key part in the market, as you know, here in the U.S. and in states like Colorado. 
our management team is, uh, and I've brought in a few people since I joined earlier this year, but comprehensive across both consumer packaged goods, experience in large scale manufacturing, uh, beverage alcohol, which is very important because there's a lot of parallels, not only in terms of marketing, but also in terms of how the distribution channel is going to work in Canada. Um, so our chief commercial officer, for example, came from one of the uh, one of the breweries in Canada that got long term experience in beverage alcohol. It's a big lead for us. So. Uh, so this is our financial snapshot, kind of difficult to see in the B, even though it's on a big screen, but give you a sense. I'll highlight a couple key things. So, um, you know, our stock price, uh, you know, when this was reported, which was September 25th, was at uh, 285. As of today, we're just below $3. Um, we have a very liquid stock, and I think that's one of the things when you look at any market is their liquidity. So um, we have 100, 104 uh, million shares, basic shares outstanding, fully diluted of 115 million. And one of the things we also do for, um, for U.S. investors is we work with a law firm out of Vancouver that will help um, any, any individual investor who's looking for liquidity. So we actually provide that service help them walk through that if they're looking to, um, you know, they can certainly, it's very easy to acquire stock, but if when you're looking to um, to exit the, your position from an equity perspective, we provide assistance in that. And I think that's a big value add for us as a company. Um, from a revenue perspective, the last 12 months at the end of May uh, was $7.5 million. Um, we, when, one thing I will mention, uh, we had a, a significant recall at the end of last year, uh, which led into January of this year, which was as a result of uh, unapproved pesticide use in the facility. Uh, we did have some contaminants and also some pesticide use of unknown origin. And one of the key things that we've done as a company is institute a number of significant changes to ensure that never happens again. Those changes range from training, increased security cameras, um, to locking down all of our approved pesticides, that there's only a select number of people in the QA departments that can access them, uh, even to the fact that our sprayers are locked down and it's only the QA people that can access them. And as a, as a result of that, we also do 100% pre-release testing of all product and submit the data to Health Canada before we release. So critical to make sure that we've got a safe product for everyone um, and Health Canada reviews and approves every batch before we put it out on the marketplace. So key thing for us. So from a plant perspective, um, you know, as Al mentioned and I mentioned, I, I came from previously from uh, Tilray. Um, that was a company that's very well known for having a very high quality product in the marketplace. And when I came on board, one of, the, one of my drives was to really focus on quality. Uh, when we fully build out our expansion that we're currently working on right now, we'll position, be positioned as the third largest indoor producer in Canada. Uh, and we certainly believe that from an indoor production perspective, that's a major differentiator in the market. Quality, you know, it's certainly routinely known that quality of indoor production versus uh, greenhouse, you're going to, in general, get a superior quality in indoor as long as you know what you're doing and you're very good at it. So, um, so we've really focused on quality, producing a premium product. We've supplemented some genetics that we had gaps in, so we've actually done some exchanges with existing licensed producers in Canada. And this is evident. So our equivalent of Leafly in Canada is Lyft. Uh, our rating currently on Lyft is 4.5 out of 5, which matches up with any other company. Uh, if you go back 12 months ago, we were a 2.7 to a 3.4. So we had a fairly low rating in terms of what consumers were rating our product. So big differentiator for us. That quality has been driven by our production practices, but also we've invested heavily in our mechanical systems. And that's critical in this space, as you guys are aware. Uh, we put in large system industrial chillers, environmental control, temperature control, humidity control is critical in an indoor environment. And that's helped us on terms of quality. Um, I've already talked a little bit about our people, but I think the one thing I would add is uh, when I came on board, I brought in a new VP of operations, came from the food industry. Uh, we're moving towards a GMP certification process right now. Uh, we're not there yet. And uh, Alan asked earlier about, you know, an ability to export internationally. So for the majority of markets such as Europe, uh, you do need to have GMP certification in order to export. Uh, we're working on that right now. And that was something, again, that I brought in. And, and again, my previous company, we were the first company to get that GMP certification in Canada. So I've been through that process before, having a pharma background. Uh, really helps kind of drive that. So we're working towards it right now. Um, you know, and, and critically, and I'll get into this, we're really well positioned for the adult rec market. Um, I think one of the key things as you look at what the adult rec market's going to look like in Canada, it's about quality. Can you have a premium product? 
you know, we're going to be the same way Colorado was for the first three years, four years, right? Since the program launched, we're not going to have enough supply um, to meet the demand. But, you know, at a certain point, supply will catch up with demand and a premium product will win out and have, you know, be in a better position to retain margin. And that's one of the key. We, we don't believe we'll see significant downward pricing pressure uh, until that three and four year period out. Um, but if we've established ourselves as we're doing today as a high quality product, we're in a much better position to retain that premium pricing. So. So if you look at, I mean, there's a lot of different forecasts on what the market's going to look like in Canada. So, you know, numerous reports have been written on this. I know, Alan, you've done some writing on this. Um, so certainly, you know, the, the projections right now, the medical revenue, so this is a little bit dated. Uh, as of the middle of this year, there were just over 200,000 medical patients in Canada. Um, the revenue in the market at the end of the quarter prior to that was pro projected to be, you know, $435, $450 million. That is expected to grow to 450,000 patients uh, on a population in Canada of 37 million people um, and a value of about $1.2 billion in terms of market. And one thing to keep in mind in our current marketplace, we're very restricted in what we can sell. So we can currently sell whole flour, blends, and then a very limited oil selection for oil ingestion, right? So our oils today can maximum 10 milligrams per dose or 3% or 30 milligrams per ml. Um, so it's certainly not a vaporizable product. It can only be used for oral ingestion. Um, and if you were going into a market that didn't have limits, that's not typically an oil you would go to market with. You'd go with a much higher concentration. But we're getting good responses from it. Certainly we see on a medical patient base, um, people are using a significant portion of oil and it represents for us almost 40% of our sales. So it's a big, uh, it's a big market for us. Some of the projections, as I said, in terms of what the adult rec market is going to look like, the analysts have projected anywhere from, you know, six to six to ten billion dollars. Um, I put in a kind of eight point six billion here. It just depends on who you look at. This is a Russell Stanley projection. CIBC World Markets has projected eight billion dollars. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the key thing is our government is moving forward towards an adult recreational program. That legislation, they have continually repeated that that legislation will be complete and the program will be up and running by the end of June next year. So, so I, you know, I just mentioned the legislation. I think one of the key things, though, that's going to be very different in Canada versus the United States, where we're seeing state by state adult recreational programs, is the federal government will set the standards and set the program in place. They have already outlined that the only production sources for the program will be licensed producers like Organogram. Um, and then the distribution will be done on a province by province basis, so like a state by state basis. So while the program has a federal oversight, each province will determine and choose how they distribute a product. It's important to keep in mind in Canada, if you look at liquor distribution, there's a real difference between each, each province, as you would see in the states, but even there is very, even more different, where we have crown corporation <coughs> or provincially run organizations in half the provinces that actually run liquor distribution. So they basically have, you know, a, a monopoly. They own liquor distribution in terms of the stores and the retail locations. Um, that's currently the case in Ontario, which is our largest province with over 35% of the population. And it's also the case in all of Atlantic Canada. Um, and then different provinces have a mix of public and private options in terms of what's allowable. What we have seen to date is that the provinces are tending to follow their liquor system. Um, we haven't seen announcements from every province, but their program looks like uh, each province as they roll it out is going to follow kind of a structure very similar to what the liquor program looks like. Um, you know, for us, I've already gone through kind of our ability to take advantage of that market is having a premium high quality product. We believe that's a big differentiator for us. And I'm going to go in shortly into kind of increased production. And, you know, what you're seeing right now is really a push and a drive towards increasing production to be ready for that marketplace. So I've talked a little bit about New Brunswick. I'll mention a few things in terms of why it's different. I, I mentioned low labor costs earlier. Uh, one of the other big differentiators for us is power. So as an indoor producer, our cost of power is one of the lowest in the country. So we're paying 5.1 cents per kilowatt hour. And if you care, compare it to Ontario, for example, their power costs are 18 cents per kilowatt hour. And if you think of the factor of how much power is as a cost of goods for you in terms of your op OPEX, um, that's a big difference. And so what we're seeing in most of Canada is the build-outs that are happening as companies are going through expansion, the majority of them are focused on greenhouse because there's concerns about cost. Um, so 
we believe, again, having a premium product and having a low power cost and low labor costs will allow us to pr produce uh, at a reasonable cost of goods that, you know, we're not going to match a large scale greenhouse company, um, but we are relatively low. So for example, today our COGS is $2 per gram. That's all in, um, in everything inclusive, in including depreciation. The only thing it doesn't include is uh, shipping costs to an individual patient because everything is by mail order. And it also doesn't include a fair market value uh, calculation that we do in terms of the biological assets. But, you know, that's that's one of the lowest indoor costs, certainly, and is not that far off. And we're driving to get that down as we build out scale, improve automation. We're going to continue to bring our COGS down. So a big differentiator for us. We also have the lowest general corporate income tax in the region. Um, there's only two other provinces that have a lower general corporate in income tax. So that's critical for us kind of going forward in terms of, you know, as we um, are generating more capital and earnings, we want to be in a strong position. So big announcement we made a few weeks ago. Um, so our home province in New Brunswick uh, was the first province to announce that they are going to go with a crown corporation or provincially run distribution program for the adult recreational program. Uh, we signed a deal, one of two companies that signed a deal for them uh, for uh, an MOU which um, commits a minimum purchase from us of 5 million grams a year. So the province will actually purchase at a minimum 5 million grams a year from us um, and they're going to oversee the, the, uh, you know, the distribution program and how that works within the province. So again, that's a key for us because that represents um, as we scale up 20 to 20, you know, 20 to 25 percent of our production going forward. Uh, so we've already got that committed. Um, that will have, we expect a retail selling price of between eight and twelve dollars per gram. Again, considering we're going to have a premium product, um, we believe that's sustainable with an average selling price of ten dollars per gram. Uh, so that has a retail value of, you know, 50 million dollars, let's say. So again, this was a landmark deal only ourselves in Canopy, one of the other companies that also has a small footprint in the province uh, were part of this deal and ours was larger in terms of our commitment from the province. So uh, big deal for us in terms of locking in our supply. So from a production perspective, it's, um, this is a little complex to kind of look at and the best way to think of it is, um, so our existing facility is the one at the bottom, the lower blue in the middle. Um, that is started out as a 32,000 square foot facility and there's a small blue area above it, light blue area that we added 4,000 square feet. So our starting facility, 36,000 square feet. Everything on the right hand side, the blue line going up and across and the large area to the right, um, that adds another um, 98,000 square feet for us and gets us up to 134,000 square feet. And then the area in the green on the left uh, is also under, and I'll, I'll talk about the time frames on these, that adds another 34,000, gets us up to 170,000 square feet of indoor production space, including mechanical, including processing, everything that's in place. What does that mean from a production perspective? Our first facility that we're operating today uh, can produce 5,200 kilos a year. The next phase of expansion, which again is fully funded and will be complete by the end of this year, going forward, can add another 10,000 kilos per year. Um, and then the, the phase three, which is the green area, uh, will add another um, uh, uh, almost 10,000 kilos per year and gets us up to 25,000 kilos annually. Uh, so that's key for us. It says 26 here. We made a change actually just recently on processing space, so we're actually down to 25,000 kilos. So we're in a position to, by the middle of next year, to be producing when the program starts 25,000 kilos a year moving forward and that's fully funded. So we have the capital to build that out as well as additional capital for other strategic initiatives. So, which is key. Um, I thought I'd add another view of that just to give you a perspective of kind of how big this is. So um, the area in blue on the, on the far left side, that's our original building as I said. The area in green is the phase two which takes us from you know, 36,000 to, uh, to 134. And then that purple area is where we're building out the additional 36,000 square feet. We own all of the yellow space as well. So that's slated for future expansion. We actually just this week announced a purchase of one of the um, properties above us. So it gives us a lot of room for expansion. This alone, um, the green, the blue, and the purple with a small part of the yellow will get us to 250,000 square feet in terms of our production area. 
what makes that very different for us, which I'll show in a second. So that's just a model of the layout. The way we produce is actually on three levels. So it's important if you're looking at our production space to think about we're not traditional greenhouse, you can't be comparing footprint to footprint. Even more, most indoor production facilities are growing on two levels, um, so they'll have two different floors. We maximize our footprint for two reasons. One is early in the licensing process in Canada, it was challenging to get an expansion of your license, right? So we were maximizing our footprint. We grow on three levels. Uh, we have a series of lift systems as well as walkways for people to access the product. It also significantly saves us on the environmental controls. You've got a large room with very good air circulation and it, we found that it actually is big cost savings in terms of environmentals. So very unique to us. We're the only company in the country that's doing that. And uh, TGS, who's a partner we work with, the Green Solution in Colorado, is doing at one of their facilities as well, based on what we were doing. So I'm going to talk about TGS a little bit. I think it's really important to understand kind of our relationship. It's one that's quite unique with, within the Canadian landscape. So uh, the Green Solution, if you don't know them in Colorado, one of the leading uh, seed-to-sale retailers, has, you know, renowned in terms of quality award-winning products. Um, in terms of their retail experience, um, in terms of product development. They have over now 400 SKUs that they offer from an adult recreational space perspective uh, with 13 retail locations that are currently operating. What our agreement with them means is that it's three parts to it. One is that on an intellectual property and engineering perspective, we can access all of their technology. So we work closely with their team as we're scaling up our production on extraction um, and we have our staff going there or their staff coming up because they've been doing this for a number of years um, and while we've been in the cannabis space for a number of years extraction is newer to us in terms of when that was allowable in Canada um, for example we recently put in place a large industrial scale uh, supercritical CO2 system that can process 5,000 kilos um, annually just with a day shift and uh, we've worked with them in terms of maximizing the output on that. We've also signed a deal with a company to do work on a microwave extraction which will assist in kind of the processing time and what you'll get as an end product in terms of supercritical CO2. So adding microwave technology to that CO2 system. The other two things it means for us is that from a formulation perspective when the edible products are allowable in the market, and the government has confirmed that will be you know, within 12 months of the program launch next year, we can bring those to market faster than other companies because we've got the formulas, we've got the products, we know what they're going to uh, end up being, and we even have the child-resistant packaging, right? So that's critical is that we know what form it's going to be, um, how acceptable it's going to be, and then we have the packaging that's going to be accepted from a government perspective. So um, it's, a, it's a big plus for us. And then, finally, if there are opp opportunities for uh, retail locations to be owned, for example, in the beverage alcohol industry, many companies have at least at a minimum a retail location within their production facility. So we can learn from what TGS has done in terms of their retailing, what they do from Plantagram and their space, um, you know, their space planning uh, to maximize their retail footprint. Uh, the other deal we have, so we have an exclusive, exclusive licensing agreement with Trailer Park Boys. Uh, for those of you that don't know Trailer Park Boys, it's a, it's a Canadian television show that's been available on Netflix for a number of years, uh, very ubiquitous with cannabis use. Um, appeals to a certain market segment. We're not looking at as our broad appeal brand, but there's a market segment that we will build off and use Trailer Park Boys uh, in terms of some of our marketing. And we believe one of the things that has come up with the regulations is there may be restrictions on celebrity spokespersons. Uh, we certainly believe as Trailer Park Boys are actually not real people, they're fictitious carriers, <laughs> characters. Um, there's ways to use them effectively. They do over 150 um, live shows a year in various locations across North America. Um, we also have product placement opportunities actually on their, on their Netflix program. So, uh, so there's a lot of ways that we can market and promote around that um, that I think is unique versus some of the deals that other companies have put in place. So, uh, We also acquired a clinic group earlier this year called Trauma Healing Center. So Trauma Healing Center is an Al Atlantic Canada East Coast based uh, clinic group, has seven locations. Um, small number of patients overall because only two of them are actually operating full-time. The other are kind of uh, part-time locations where they're renting space at different times. But 
What makes them different is that they're the only Canadian clinic group that has a multidisciplinary approval for veterans. Uh, and if you don't know, all veterans in Canada of either military veterans, first responders, uh, are covered for medical cannabis use by a federal program. So they have 100% insurance coverage. Um, so that's critical for us to take advantage of, of that. So I guess finally, a couple key things I would highlight, you know, for us, I, I mentioned our cost of goods. Uh, it's really certainly, and we will continue to push that cost of goods down. Only two ways you can do that. One is driving up yields, which we continue to do. And the other is uh, by, you know, reducing your cost, so your OPEX overall. And we're doing that through automation in our new facility build out. You're going to see um, a lot of automation or, you know, standard things like, auto, you know, automated potting machines and stripping machines, um, a semi-automated packaging line. Uh, for whole flour and things like that, that'll be part of that next phase. It'll be done by the end of this year. Um, we have a very high average selling price at $8. So that's our price today in the medical market um, that we're able to garner back as an average selling price uh, in terms of our patient population. Uh, we've seen year over year 31% growth. And as I said, at the end of our May quarter, uh, we had $48.4 million on the balance sheet. So. So kind of key takeaways, uh, you know, we're very well positioned, as I said, to be a, a leading producer in, the, in both the medical and the adult recreational space. Um, medical is gaining acceptance. We're seeing the stigma eliminate over time, as you've seen in U.S. states where that has occurred over, over time as well. I think what one of the key differences, though, when you look at Canada, I mentioned Veterans Affairs. There are other programs that are now, we're getting insurance coverage. So Shoppers Drug Mart Loblaws, which is our largest pharmacy chain in the country, uh, they've announced that all of their employees and beneficiaries of their employees have coverage for medical cannabis use for a couple indications. We're seeing other insurers do one-off programs, and a lot of employers are actually allowing people to use their healthcare spending account, which is kind of typically what we'd use for chiropractor or or other coverage like that up to five or five hundred $500 a year or thousand dollars a year to help in your medical cannabis coverage. So that's a big difference. We are actually getting insurance coverage. Um, I talked about our production capacity. So by the end of this year going forward, we'll be at 16,000 kilos. And by the end of, uh, by the middle of next year, we'll be at 25,000 kilos going forward. Um, I talked a lot about as well about the rec program in Canada and the timing. So um, I guess we're at time. So I'll, I'll just end things there and say that, you know, we believe, and from what we've seen in the shift in quality, we're really well positioned uh, to take advantage of the marketplace. So I guess I'll open things up to questions. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I had a quick question on uh, on distribution. And, and you mentioned, like, if you're permitted to, you, you put a store in, uh, in your factory. But, sure. Uh, would you open stores in BC if it plays out that way? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So um, we're actually part of a co-op group. It was announced last oh, week. Yeah. yeah so. Um, yeah, so there's uh, there are 13 companies that have come together to develop a co-op. So in provinces where private retail distribution is allowable, uh, we're looking to form a co-op and work with either um, large retailers within that space or raise our own capital to kind of build retail locations. And part of the reason we've done that is we know two things. One is there's going to be a supply issue for the first couple of years in the program. Supply will not meet demand. So by coming together as a co-op, at least we'll have a blended supply to be able to fill that retail channel. One of the challenges if we build our own stores is we'd have to ensure that we had product there, right? The last thing you want to do is build your own retail location and not have product available. And we know that was an issue in some states as they've rolled out. We saw that recently in Nevada, right? So, uh, so that's one, one of the initiatives on the co-op. And the other is also um, it allows you to kind of mix a large-scale producer like ourselves along with some smaller producers that are kind of craft brewers. And I think it gives the consumer a more complete offering, right? So that's how we've taken that approach. Is, it, is that kind of uh, competition with, with uh, Tweet Main Street? Yeah, so, so that's an initiative they've put in place, and I would say, yeah, it's competing with that. So. Any questions out here? Because I have more if you don't. <laughs> Anybody? Shy. Okay. okay. Uh, my next one is, uh, so you, you've done a good job of recognizing IP deficiency that the whole country lacks. It's kind of strange. Uh, things are legal there, but because they don't have the kinds of products that are federally illegal here, but right. very popular. Uh, is that enough, what you guys have done, or is that an area where you need to add? Because I, I see people on the medical side adding devices right. and things like that, but is, is adding IP a, a priority? Uh, it is, actually. We just announced, so one of our um, key individuals in our group, Michelle Robichaud, is a PhD who came from the Irving R&D world. Uh, we just transitioned into a director of innovation, so he's actually going to lead 100% of his time focused on assessing that. I mean, we are getting... 
uh, companies approaching us all the time that have kind of new forms, new innovative forms, primarily on the medical side. Um, and we're looking at those. And uh, it's challenging to assess those unless you have dedicated people on that, right? So now we've dedicated Michelle's time to do that. And I think for us, that's going to allow us to have a systematic approach on assessing those new technologies, that new IP, because they do have applicability both in the medical space and the rec space as well. So. Um, that was a question. Good, we have one under. Go ahead. Could you just elaborate a little bit more on the um, process, process period that you said about microwaving? Yeah, so, um, so what we've done is we've, we've partnered with a research group that has uh, a long-term experience in hemp extraction, and they do use microwave technology to supplement the processing. So theoretically, what it would do is two things. You reduce the extraction time dramatically from hours to minutes, and you should increase your cannabinoid yield that you get out of your extraction process, right? So it's been done in hemp extraction, and we believe it's applicable to cannabis extraction. So um, now one of the challenges is retrofitting the existing equipment to use that microwave technology, but certainly it's a proven technology in extraction in other areas, so. Isn't it radiation, low, low emitting radiation? Uh, it, it is, but it's it's at a level that so certainly it's not um, it's not like using gamma radiation or anything like that. It's for a very short burst of time. Um, there's no issues from a regulator perspective in terms of what you're looking to do. It's just looking to kind of increase activity um, of in the extraction process, basically. So radiation, radiation. Yeah, I mean it's it's low level. I mean certainly, yeah. The. Uh I had another question on uh, the three level. That's kind of new. You guys aren't doing that yet, right? You're about no, we are. Yeah, so we are doing that. I think, you know, we, we, we didn't necessarily start out that way, but then we looked to maximize our footprint. We said we'll do three level. So one of the big changes between our existing facility, um, we've increased the size of our rooms as well. So one of the challenges of three levels um, in some of our existing rooms is that we can only use 600 watt lights because of the cap and you need some headspace. So we've added a foot and a half to each level in the new building so that we can use 1,000 watt lights routinely. And again, we found that from a workspace perspective, from environmental's perspective, there's big savings to us in terms of doing that three-level production. So when you're comparing apples to apples from facilities, um, you know you have to think of us as having not three times the amount because not every square foot, but we certainly are much larger than you know you can't compare a, a 250,000 square foot greenhouse to our 250,000 square feet facility, right? So, sorry, you had a question earlier. How much of your business relies on the U.S. market? Yeah, so we're not able to, ex to sell into the U.S. market at all. So certainly there's one of the kind of restrictions, federally legal, illegal here in the U.S. still. Um, we are looking, and one of the questions Alan had asked earlier about looking at export markets. Um, so, you know, I had previously had experience, as I said, in terms of being the first company to export to Europe. We're looking at that right now. I think there's a lot of opportunities. Those opportunities are really near term. So uh, for the first couple of years in many of the countries like Germany, uh, like the Czech Republic, they'll look at uh, a, an external support, uh, <coughs> supply from another country like Canada. And everybody looks at Canada because we have the most heavily regulated federal program in place. Um, so there are opportunities to sell. But I think as over time, you'll see domestic production built out in those jurisdictions, right? And we've seen a couple companies, for example, um, recently announced a production facility in Portugal so that they can supply the European market out of a low-cost market there. So, um, so yeah, today nothing into the U.S. and, and, and until the, I don't see that changing any time uh, in the future. But Europe, Australia, New Zealand, some Latin American countries are really big markets for export right now. In terms of revenue, uh, I break down the, the country into about three or four different uh, buckets. And the big bucket, uh, you know, the guys that have a lot more revenue than you right now are global. So a little bit different positioning. And then you have a lot of competitors that are smaller than you and then some that aren't even selling yet. Sure. Uh, how do you see the market shaping up? Because a lot of those big guys are buying production facilities out of bankruptcy or late stage applicants. And you guys have been very focused on just Moncton, yeah. uh, New Brunswick. 
How did, how's that going to work? Yeah, so we, we – I mean, I'll, I'll answer it in two ways, I guess. One is we spend a lot of time looking at opportunities, right? I mean, you, you, you're you naive if you don't think there's going to be M&A activity in this space. Um, there is going to be. Um, but I think it's going to be very different than what we've seen today. What we've seen today is a couple acquisitions of companies that were under financial difficulty, um, uh, large, large acquisitions in one case that was under financial difficulty. And then you've seen applicants acquired, right, early in the process because the belief is that by – an existing licensed producer acquiring another company, they can help accelerate the process, right? By bringing in technology, bringing in methodology, but also just the fact they're already licensed, Health Canada will accelerate them, right? So that's that's kind of one approach to date. Um, we've seen, the, the other approach has been to grow out organically, right? We've seen companies like Metrum build secondary facilities. Cantrust recently announced a, another facility licensed. Um, as I outlined for us, we have the advantage of a lot of property in terms of where we are while today we're very focused on building out our existing facility because we have low power costs and low labor costs there um, we are always looking at opportunities one of the challenges i have when i assess opportunities when you look at applicants or if you look at um, newer companies that have just recently been licensed for cultivation is you know their valuations don't make sense to me in terms of um, where what they're looking for because you know they've got very small facilities um, and they're not really at the point they need to be from a technology perspective so we don't see them as actually adding a ton of value in the near term it's not really accretive right in terms of as an acquisition I think you look at it and say you may do it strategically because it's a province or a region you want to be in, but in terms of adding value, you're better to actually build out um, in that province yourself. It's more cost effective today based on the cost, and we're seeing companies do that. Well, what about you? Would you? That was my next question. Would you guys do that? We're considering. I mean, we're always kind of looking at, you know, what, again, one of the key advantages we have within Atlantic Canada is, we, you know, we have access to government funding. They're supporting right. jobs programs. Um, so, you know, we have certainly talked to other provinces and looked at and we just, you know, we haven't moved forward to date, but we certainly are always actively looking at it, so. Do, do you feel like the industry, uh, I've heard some of your competitors say it's going to end up being uh, some, a few big companies and then kind of crap, and I don't see you guys fitting into either of those two. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we're, you know, certainly there's three companies that are significantly larger than us right now in terms of production capacity. What we're focused on is being, you know, a high quality producer from an indoor perspective, right? And, you know, again, most of the expansion we can do to see in Canada is greenhouse. Uh, we believe that a high quality indoor pr product is going to demand a premium. Um, so where we, you know, we are, we will be by middle of next year, the third largest indoor producer in the space. So while we're not the third largest, we see ourselves playing in that space. Um, and you'll continue to see us focus on that. We believe quality is a differentiator. Um, so yeah, we're not a craft brewer. We're going to be a high volume, high quality producer. So, so you, because of your low cost of production mainly, that's going to enable you to compete with uh, exactly. multi-campus places exactly. that have bigger distribution. Yeah, and, and the multi-campus, you know, so there there are synergies for them, but the synergies are limited. You're basically talking about production facilities that are operating independently. The only synergies you get are, yeah, you know, there's a lot of overlap, right? I mean, so. Yes. Sorry, yeah. When you talk about your cost of production, is there like a standard uh, assessment for coming up with, okay. I <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And so I thought like that yeah. answer, it's a funny question. I saw one of the KPIs on there, and I was just curious like what went into that. And, and so I don't know if you, if you guys keep, keep metrics on like total cost of production per gram versus you know, what your retail price Yeah, so, and that's the biggest challenge right now, and I think it, and we continue to say this actually to analysts, is that the analysts should mandate or push to say every company should do it the same way. And if every company did it the same way, then it'd be easier for investors to look at it and say, you know, here's how we should assess things. I mean, we, we our cost of goods is an all-in cost, including depreciation, so it's all production costs, uh, depreciation on CapEx, it's OpEx, it's materials, it's inputs packaging even, so it's everything except for final shipping and the fair market value adjustment. Um, not every company includes packaging, for example. Not every company includes depreciation, so it's challenging to compare COGS from company to company, so, yeah. Any other questions? Do you leave off any good ones? No, I just, again, I think, you know, I would just stress, I think we're, we're in a unique position in terms of the Canadian marketplace. I think Organigram, we're, we're differentiated in many ways in terms of, you know, two things. One is we're producing a high pro quality product indoor, which we believe is a big differentiator. And we see that in the U.S. markets. You can go into dispensaries, you know, in Colorado or our locations, and you can see product being sold at $15 a gram still, right? It's, if it's a high quality product, 
uh, good cannabinoid profile, a strain that people are looking for, you're going to get a premium pricing for that. So we're focused on that marketplace. And I believe also, as I said, you know, our uh, agreement with uh, the Green Solution and TGS really positions us for the rec market as that grows and expands, right? And that's going to be a big difference for us is being able to bring products quicker to market than other players. So for me, those are, our, are really our two big differentiators. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, all.